Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Community Heroes. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to talk to someone very special. Uh, if you've been following us, you know we're uh, very much uh, in focus with focusing on at-risk, special needs population, and we're very uh, heavy on mentoring, and uh, especially in the transitional phase. So today, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Miss Annie Tope. And we're going to find out a little bit about what she does and how she has contributed to the focus of uh, at risk special needs population. So how are you doing, Ms. Uh, Tobin? I'm great, Tyrone. So happy to be here with you today um, and have this awesome conversation. All right. Um, so well, I'm not going to uh, beat around the bush. Uh, one of the first things I think our viewers want to know is uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your hometown? Sure. So um, I am from Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> I grew up on the north side um, near Rogers Park, not far from the lake, uh, Lake Michigan. Um, when you're in Chicago, you just call it the lake because it's the lake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside D.C. So that's where I'm based. And um, in my business, Accessible College, um, where I'm the founder and director, uh, we work with people across the country. So I work with people nationally. So I get to connect with people across the United States and sometimes even abroad too. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so I mentioned about you know, your, your business sales because we're going to kind of jump to that a little bit later on, but that kind of brings to the building up to that question. Can you uh, just send me a little bit about your educational background? Sure. So um, I have a bachelor's degree from DePaul University in secondary education. Um, I had thought my trajectory was going to be to be a um, social studies teacher. Um, and I did my uh, student teaching in high school and I loved it, but I decided to join the Peace Corps right after I did um, my undergrad. So I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia from 2003 to 2005, where I lived in far Eastern Mongolia. Um, and I worked with teachers who were former, uh, formerly Russian teachers who were then told that they would be English teachers. Um, and so we worked on a lot of like English language and conversation because they had taught themselves how to speak English from books. Um, and so they had great grammar, but they didn't really know how to like use English, right? And so right. we did a lot of conversation. Um, after I completed two years in the Peace Corps, I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, and I studied special education. And I got a Fulbright um, scholarship to go back to Mongolia and do research. Um, and because of my Peace Corps experience working in a school, I decided to study Mongolian teachers' perceptions of disability in the classroom, because one of the things that I observed as a Peace Corps volunteer um, was that there weren't a lot of students with visible disabilities in, in general public education. So I kind of wondered, where are these students? Um, and the students that were there um, had a lot of support from their friends because the buildings weren't accessible. There were a lot of barriers to education. Um, and so really um, I gained an understanding of what it's like to live with a disability in the Mongolian context, but then also thinking through how teachers perceived students with disabilities in their classrooms. And their classroom situation is a, is a little bit different than how things are in the, in the US. Um, and also just cultural perceptions of disability are, are quite different than how they are in, in the United States too. So um, that experience taught me a lot. So that's, um, that's, that's kind of the, the um, broad strokes of my education. I also have a, um, a certificate in health coaching from Georgetown University as well, um, which really informs my practice now in working with students and families with physical disabilities and health conditions. Yeah, and I know when I was just reading about all your accomplishments, I was like, man, I said this lady has accomplished a lot, uh, just uh, academic wise. Not even talking about the professional side. I don't know, like, academic wise, I, I was I was very impressed. Um, so, um, um, 
you kind of touched on a little bit, but could you just tell me about um, your ladder uh, for uh, professionalism uh, that kind of built you up to founding uh, Accessible College? Sure. So um, I often joke that I spent most of my 20s trying not to have a real job because <laughs> I, you know, I did the Peace Corps. I got a Fulbright and went back to, to Mongolia. I did graduate school. Um, and I really like steeped myself in kind of the academic world. Um, and then the time came where I actually had to start working. <laughs> I mean, I'd always had lots of little jobs and part-time jobs and things like that, but um, getting a full-time job was on my purview. And I worked for the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, um, which is out here in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, and kind of oversees and works with university centers across the United States, every state um, and territory on disability issues. And one of the projects that I worked on was the National Service Inclusion Project for getting people with disabilities involved in AmeriCorps service. Um, because I had a background in the Peace Corps and in service in general, um, it, was a, it was a great fit for me to think about how we could make um, some of the AmeriCorps programs more accessible to people with disabilities and make that a greater opportunity for people with disabilities. Um, after that, I went on to work for six years as the Associate Director of the Disability Support Office at Georgetown University. And that's where I really got the idea for Accessible College because I had so many students who I worked with um, who were coming into Georgetown, not really understanding how to request accommodations, the type of accommodations to request, um, how it might be different from high school to college in terms of accommodations and what the process looked like. Um, and I worked with undergraduate, graduate and medical school students. So a wide range of age and background. Um, and one of the things that always stuck out to me was the fact that these students would come in not really realizing that once they had transitioned from IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which governs K through 12 schools, to the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, that now that they were in college, the responsibility was theirs to self-disclose, to follow the university's process to request accommodations, and that they needed to be able to self-advocate um, and for most of the students I worked with, this was like their first time kind of living independently away from mom and dad. So there were other considerations, you know, housing, dining, transportation, programmatic that they maybe didn't have to think about when they were living at home during high school. And then they now had to figure out immediately without having a lot of um, transition support. Um, and one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight too was that you know, students with IEPs, individualized education plans, they get transition services as a part of their IEP process, but that looks different in every school and in every school district. Um, and students with 504 plans, they don't receive any specific transition planning. So if you have a chronic health condition and maybe, or if you have a physical disability, because I work with some students who have physical disabilities and have a 504 plan just to be able to like access their classrooms and things like that, they're not aware of the things that they should be thinking about when they're starting to think about moving out of their parents' home and maybe living on a college campus or the types of accommodations that might serve and support them there. Um, and so my business now, I work specifically with students with physical disabilities, so wheelchair users, students with paralysis, students with mobility impairments, um, and health conditions. And the health conditions range from everything from um, autoimmune disorders, to lupus, to Crohn's disease, to diabetes, to mental health conditions, um, and everything in between. And quite frankly, many of the students I work with have comorbid or co-occurring conditions. So maybe a mental health condition and a physical disability or a mental health condition and a chronic health condition. Um, and so I start working with students as early as ninth grade through graduate school. And we do kind of customized one-on-one -on -one transition support. So working with them to figure out what skills they're going to need to be able to live independently, whether that's medication management um, or continuity of care. So knowing how to talk to their doctors or transition to a new doctor um, and also understanding the self-advocacy skills that they're going to need once they get into college, because it's huge. And I think a lot of parents are also surprised too. They don't realize that 
they can't really be a part of that process anymore either. That catches a lot of parents by surprise because there's a federal law called <laughs> FERPA, the uh, Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So once a student starts college, mom and dad can't be calling in and checking up on grades and things like that. So there's a transition for both people, for the parents and for the student. Yeah, it's, uh, it's ironic you brought that part up um, because uh, as you know, part of uh, my work experience uh, at the community college here uh, where I worked there, I was uh, uh, an achievement coach for five years. And, you know, so you had these uh, students come from high school to the community college center. And like you just said, uh, if they had uh, been so involved in their lives, uh, in grade school, so they would come in my office as we were doing the, uh, an assessment to kind of help them with, you know, pick up the schedule and do these things. And uh, we would have to tell the parents, you know, uh, you know, they, they would sit there, but they really couldn't, you know, tell the, the, their child what to do or you know, we had to tell them if you know you would have to get you know sign this disclosure, you know, like you just said, FERPA. And uh, a, a lot of them, you know, they feel like, well, I'm still going to be you know, overbearing. I had, I had, I had to be honest. With you. Sometimes parents can actually cripple, you know, a child's independence uh, whenever they're overbearing. And, and the transition is is very important to let them you know take accountability of their destiny. Uh, so, you know, we I, I, I ran into that a couple of times uh, during that time of my, my life, um, and which is why it's so important for Access College to kind of help them gain this independence and make their own uh, steps. So, um, and my, uh, my next thing, uh, uh, I kind of Touched into accessible college, um, your business, but I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to mention. Uh, yeah. yeah. So first, first before just like tracking back to what you just said, because it prompted something for me. Um, in defense of parents, because I am one. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> okay, there. In defense of parents, like there's a lot going on, right? Like sometimes day to day life, especially with a teenager, like God bless teenagers, they can be challenging people. Um, it, it can be really hard to like be thinking ahead because you're so busy as a parent and as a family, just trying to like get through that day. Right. And to like get to the end of the week and to, you know, you can only think so far in advance. One of the things that I think is really helpful uh, for parents to start thinking about earlier on is like, how can I allow my student to take on some of the roles that I maybe do as a parent, right? So if it's like scheduling the doctor's appointment, or, you know, if I know that my kid has an, a doctor's appointment coming up, actually sitting down with my student and or my child and saying, you know, like, oh, we're going to go to the doctor on Friday. Like, do you have any questions that you want to ask the doctor? A typical teenager might say, no, I don't have any questions because that's what a lot of teenagers do. But like, just engaging in that process where it's like, have you thought about it? Like, did you, you know, did you want to ask the doctor about this? Do you want to write that down so that you can remember to ask the doctor? Just starting to figure out those little ways that we can start to build those skills so that students actually understand, like, if I, if I plan for this or if I prepare for this, I might have a better outcome, right? And so that, that's, that's the type of skill building that's like essential for college and for independent living, you know, so that mom and dad um, can take, can start to like give, make the leash a little bit longer, right? To give that student more independence, right? Whether it's like filling a prescription themselves or making a doctor's appointment or even like learning to make their own food, you know, <laughs> like right. make a sandwich. Like, um, you know, I have a, I have a toddler, she's five. We, we practice like skill building stuff. So she's like making her, she loves it. She's making her own sandwiches. She's doing stuff that she can do. Um, although sometimes I know it's easier for me to like put the clothes on her. It's quicker. Right. And I think a lot of times as a parent, we're thinking like, I don't want to wait for this kid to like, get it together. I'm going to do it. for them, Right. And so that's like, that's my, 
spiel, but we know like if we, if we can start students on this track earlier, and this is what the data kind of bears out, then they can have better outcomes and be better prepared because students with disabilities in particular drop out of college at a much higher rate than their non-disabled peers. So we have to say like, why, why is that? Part of that might be because they're really not prepared for, to self-advocate and to, to manage all of the things that come along with being in college. So that's that. So putting that, putting that over there. Um, accessible college, we do a couple things. So we have um, physical disability college planning, health condition college planning. So we work with students um, wherever they're at and families wherever they're at in that process. So I mentioned that we work with students starting in ninth grade through graduate school. For some of the younger students, it's starting to identify, you know, what their accommodations and needs are in that space that they're in now and starting to think through what that might look like for them in college and then figuring out what are the skills that they need so that they can achieve a little bit more independence. For some of the older students, the kind of end of sophomore year of high school, junior year, we start thinking about what questions do you need to be asking when you're going on college tours? Um, what other things in the community do you need to be looking for? Maybe you need to be at a school that's like closer to a hospital center or a specific set of doctors or um, specific transit things if you want to be able to quickly get home. Uh, and we start thinking about what are those kind of critical needs. It could also be like thinking through the assistive technology or supports that a student might need once they're in school and starting to work with that technology or work with that stuff now. Um, I have a couple students who I'm working with who have service animals and they're getting those service animals their sophomore or junior year of high school so that they can transition with them and be more comfortable with them. Things like that, just starting to think through some of those um, pieces. Um, so we do um, for health condition college planning and physical dis disability college planning, we have kind of a monthly membership plan. And then um, I also do executive function coaching with a lens towards uh, students with physical disabilities and health conditions. So thinking through the other things that come along with being a person with a physical disability or health condition. So the medication management pieces, the time it might take you to actually get ready or the time that you need for other personal care things and factoring that into your whole kind of academic vision, right? Of thinking through how are you planning out your day? How are you managing these things? How do you create structures so that you can kind of keep track of things? Um, and then I also do post-transition college coaching. So there are some students I work with who need a little bit of support in thinking through, um, you know, how they can connect with their professors, what questions they should be asking in the disability support office, um, thinking through that time management piece. So um, I work with students in that realm as well. Um, and right now, and, and Tyrone, this might have been how you like kind of found me. I have a partnership. Um, so we're, we're recording this in January 2021. Um, and so I have a partnership with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And through the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, students uh, any age who are transitioning to college who have paralysis, so any type of paralysis, can work with me for free through the Reeve Foundation. Um, so, and that's open for everybody. The, the, the funding is limited and the amount of consultations is limited, but if people are interested in that, you can go to the Reeve Foundation website and contact the information specialist to find out more about, about that. <laughs> All right, uh, that's awesome information. Definitely please review this right now, definitely take advantage of that. Um, the Reeve Foundation, I've been kind of following it for a couple of months now. Um, I've just been seeing a lot of good things that um, they do. I, I, I think last spring, I remember, uh, just even small things I think they had to where if you uh, could prove that I think you had a, a disability, I think they were giving away Google Minis to uh, individuals. Just, they have them with um, uh, just things around the house with voice commands and things like that. So, I mean, it, which is, you know, accessible devices are very important towards being independent. Um, so, um, but yes, I, I saw you, uh, saw your name on there, but I actually 
saw some of your uh, stuff, I think, on, on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, and I was like, okay. And I, I was curious. I said, is this what college? Let me see. What is this about? Um, so, with, with that being said, uh, uh, so I, I think well, the next question I'm going to jump into is um, you gave us a lot of information about your college and what it does. What, um, what information would you give uh, parents or, or that uh, student that's about to actually leave out of the high school that's trying to transition either into higher education or maybe the work, workforce field? Yeah. I'm like, um, and I think you, yeah, and I think you gave us the information uh, a little bit about uh, questions, but I didn't know if you wanted to give any other information also. Yeah, um, it, and that's such a good question. So I should have mentioned too in the beginning too that I've also had um, kind of employment experience as well. So I worked as a contractor for the Department of Labor um, for Job Corps, um, making sure that Job Corps centers were a ADA compliant um, and training uh, people at Job Corps centers on disability and education. Um, and so I have a little bit of the employment kind of knowledge and skill set as well. Um, so one of the things that's really critical, and you asked about people who are leaving high school now and starting college, I would say like, if parents can, if families can start that process even earlier, like that ninth grade, start to think about the transition planning. And really, if you have a student who has an IEP as a parent, sometimes we don't, you know, not everybody has a background in education, right? Like not everybody knows what questions to be asking. But um, one of the things that you can always bring to the table as a parent um, or as a student is, you know, how are we planning? The question you can ask is, how are we planning for my eventual departure from high school and into college? What are the things that I should be learning or doing at each level and at each point that's going to set me up and prepare me for college? For students who have more significant physical disabilities, um, a lot of times there's a lag in getting connected with their state's vocational rehabilitation um, services, and each state is a little bit different in how they do this, but at age 14, students can start to register for VR services, voc rehab services. And so you really wanna make sure that you are registered and on the radar of the VR people and engaging them to see like, are there opportunities for you know, employment or resources or assistive technology, because there's a lot of stuff out there. It's just that people don't always know to ask for it, right? That's a big problem. Um, the other thing is if your student is, it's January now, so if your student is in their senior year of high school and they're heading to college in, um, in, in the fall, if that's the goal, right now, theoretically, they would be receiving some of their um, acceptances kind of this time in the next month or two, or maybe they already did if they did it early decision. Um, you really want to be connecting with the disability support offices at those at the college either that they've chosen ahead of time so that you're having upfront conversations about what the student's needs are, what their expectations are, um, you know, how would they go through and register for disability support services. And if your student has a choice or if they're starting to think which school, if they've been accepted to several schools and then they have to pick, they might even wanna interview the disability support offices as well. So coming up with a list of questions and thinking through um, what the students' needs are, and then asking those questions before actually choosing, because people don't realize this, but you know, universities are supposed to be ADA compliant, um, but what that actually looks like on the ground is very different from place to place. And the care and the type of accommodations that you'll receive at one place, one school is very different than what you might receive at another school. So there's no kind of like universal, like you're gonna get this at every single school. You have to have those conversations up front um, with the disability support offices. And I think a lot of people don't realize that they should actually be considering that as a part of their consideration when they're looking at different schools. Um, so that's kind of like the biggest tip I have. People, people sometimes think um, if they disclose a disability to the disability support office that that might impact admission to the school. Um, and so people should know that 
you don't, there's no, like when you apply to college, there's no checkbox that says, do you have a disability? Um, and, and they couldn't ask that, but it's a, it's a, it's a blind admissions process. Right. And so if you go and talk to the disability support office, that's completely separate from the admissions department. They don't, they don't talk about it. They don't connect at all. And a lot of people are concerned, like if I disclose this disability, I'm not going to get accepted to the university, but that's, that's not true. Um, so it's important that people understand that they can be asking these questions up front and engaging in these conversations without being afraid that they're going to be denied acceptance because of a disability. Yeah, that's quite right. And, and that's some very good advice. Uh, uh, especially, like I said, early, uh, for the process early, uh, definitely get in contact with your uh, uh, special needs counselor or advisor or whoever the person may be for the contact. Uh, and, and also, if you are already transitioning to the institution and you're realizing that there's still some things that need to be done to meet accommodation, I would also advise that person to not be uh, afraid to, uh, like I said, get in contact with their counselor and make this stuff aware um, because sometimes these things uh, in, the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things when you get to administration and budgeting you know, they have a process of what's important sometimes. And sometimes you have to keep reiterating that this is important. This right here needs to be uh, taken care of. And it could be something as simple as uh, ADA buttons, you know, door needs to be automatic, you know. Uh, but, you know, definitely I will tell anyone, you can uh, advocate for the advancement of inclusion wherever you're at. So, well, I have two questions. Uh, I want to say again, thank you so much for just being patient with me. Um, the next question is, uh, can you just uh, kind of tell us about a moment that uh, with your uh, experience in education and, uh, you know, um, being a professional in this field, that, you know, it was kind of like one of the goals that you checked off that you wanted to accomplish I'm on the way. Hmm. I mean, it's so hard to narrow it down to just one. <laughs> well, well, you, you, can, you can say a, a couple of them. Uh, well, I, I think like for me more generally, there, there have just been so many times in my work with students, especially when I was at Georgetown, where I, I was on the other side of the desk and they were coming to me. Um, there was one time where I, um, a student I was working with who it was June, he was supposed to start school in the fall, and he's a, he was a wheelchair user, he had spinal muscular atrophy type 2, so he couldn't self-transfer um, from his chair to bed or to any other seating situation. Um, he needed help with daily living activities, so like bathing and eating and things like that. And um, I was having a conversation with him and his mom, and, and, and they were saying, oh, you know, he can our plan is for him to live with his friend from high school. And that person's going to just, you know, be there to help him and get it, get out of bed and all these things. And it, it occurred to me that like, they hadn't really thought that through. Right. So I was like, well, what if the roommate's not there? What if there was a fire? What is the, have you had a conversation with the roommate about, you know, the caregiving responsibilities and, and, and no one had really engaged that family in that conversation. Nobody had really engaged that student in that conversation. Ultimately through that conversation, you know, the student needed to hire a personal care attendant, which then was challenging for him because he wasn't really prepared to be an employer too, because he's 18 and transitioning to college and nobody had really talked to him about what that would be like. And so that was a moment where I was like, this this could have started a long time ago, you know, several years, at least months or several years prior to start thinking about like, how is he going to live independently? What are the things that we're concerned about? What are the things that we want to work on? What skills, you know? Uh, and um, so that was one thing that really got me. The other times, I think people don't know this too, but accommodations in college aren't retroactive. So I often say that accommodations are like 
um, insurance, even if you don't think you're going to use them, you, you want to have them. Like when you get into a car accident, you're happy you have insurance, right? <laughs> so, so, um, students would come to me in the middle of the first semester and they would, you know, disclose that they had X, X conditions. So uh, chronic health conditions, mental health conditions, um, whatever. And they would say, I thought I had everything under control or then I had a flare up and now, I'm getting an F in this class because I had to miss a week and I couldn't do the work or whatever. And I would say like, ah, it's so, it's so, it's so tricky because it's like, well, now we can get accommodations in place moving forward, but we can't go back in time. Right. And yeah. so those are the times too, where I'm like, if someone had engaged this person earlier on prior to them, you know, enrolling in the university and had a conversation about like, Oh, so you have, you know, X, Y, Z chronic health condition, like you should think about this and here's some other things that you might want to request. And here's how you can put that in place. Um, Maybe that would have prevented that crisis. Right. And so we're not having these upfront conversations with students. So they don't think that they don't think that they're going to need these things. And, um, and so those are kind of two scenarios where that have kind of directed me to, to this role that I have now. Um, And something you said earlier, too, about um, connecting with the counselor at the college, Um, if students are looking for that information, you can just look up, go to the college's website and just put in disability in the search engine. And usually that'll take you to either the person who's in charge of um, disability support services, or it'll direct you to the um, disability support office, which might have a different name. It could be like accessibility services or student disability services or disability support services. So they're all different at every place. Um, so you can look up that information and see, it, it'll usually tell you on the website, what is the process for requesting accommodations? What types of documentation do you need? You know, what type, what, what's the timeline look like? So how many weeks do they need to get things in place? It'll usually tell you all that stuff. So you can do some of that work independently. Definitely. Um, so um, lastly, um, for everyone that I had the opportunity to um, view this uh, interview, could you just uh, tell them how they can uh, connect with you and the Sessible College and learn more? Sure. There's a lot of ways to find me. Um, So you can go to my website, which is www.accessiblecollege.com. I have a blog. I have a newsletter sign up. I do a monthly e-newsletter. So you can find that sign up on the bottom of the page. I think down towards the left. I'm trying to recreate it in my brain right now. Um, And then Facebook, um, you can just put in Accessible College and I will come up. And then Twitter, Um, It's at ACSS College. Um, So those are a couple of ways that people can find out more. The newsletter is probably the best way to just keep informed about new projects and things I have going on um, and promotions that I have going on as well. So I mentioned the the project I have going on with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation right now. Um, And then I'm working on a few more projects, which I hope to highlight um, soon, which will have resources for Um, other students with disabilities too. I've worked on some stuff for students with invisible disabilities and I'm working on some stuff right now for students who are blind and visually impaired. Um, So there's a lot more that's coming out every day. That sounds awesome. Um, And of course, uh, for our viewers that are in my voice right now, you always can connect with us. Um, The best way is to go to our official website, www.communityheroes.net. And if you go there on the bottom of our page, we have our various platforms. You can reach us through Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Also subscribe to us. And if you want to be involved, uh, please uh, be a volunteer or just uh, donate to one of our various uh, forms of raising uh, awareness for this population. Um, this is January, so if you, you're seeing this, uh, definitely support us for our upcoming uh, webinar at the end of the month for National Mentor Month. And as always, thank you for viewing, and I'll see you in the next interview. Thanks, Tyrone.